Good morning and good afternoon, and thank you for attending this morning's webinar entitled Basics of Standby Generators and Emergency Power. Uh, first, we're going to take care of a few housekeeping items. I know uh, we're probably going to get a lot of questions over the course of the next hour. Um, on your little toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see there is a drop-down for questions. Please type any questions that you may get uh, over the course of the next 45 to 60 minutes and uh, Kurt will answer those at the very end of the presentation. Probably the most popular question we get though is, can we get a copy of the presentation? And the answer to that is absolutely. After the presentation, you're gonna be getting an email uh, from us. If you could just respond to that email and let us know you wanna copy the presentation, I will send that out to you. We will also be recording the, this webinar and that will be available on our YouTube page uh, probably by Monday or Tuesday. So if you happen to miss the webinar or you think somebody else could get value out of it, then uh, just know that it'll be available there as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our instructor for today, Kurt Brizendine. Please, Kurt, take it away. Thank you, John. Uh, as John was pointing out, so today we'll be going over the basics of standby generators and emergency power. Um, I will be doing a just an overview of the course. Keep in mind this course is in fact a 16 hour course. And so a little bit about myself. Um, I'm, I'm hailing for, to you guys from Chicago. And I was in the Navy about 10 years. As you can see up here on the slide, I was a weapon system technician, an ammunition explosive administrator. And of course my primary skill set now is uh, as a master instructor and curriculum developer. And so uh, I focus on the basically the research and development of our courses for TPC. And I also deliver some of the courses. Um, I worked for Exxon Nuclear for a while. I got also qualified as a master instructor under the nuclear regulatory community. Um, and uh, that's because I was a maintenance engineering instructor for Exxon Nuclear. Uh, however, I kind of had to leave that job mainly because uh, there was no way I was competitive with, for promotion until I got a college degree. And so I went to Northern Illinois University and studied engineering and Western history. And all of this, everything that I have done up to this point is basically in the realm so I can become a better instructor. This is something I've greatly loved doing. So uh, uh, my background has, has, has definitely prepared me to, to help serve my students better. And that is my interest in general in all of this is that I want to uh, make sure that I answer your questions, make sure that you feel like you learned something that was useful. And so when you uh, ask your questions, please keep that in mind because that's really, I'm, I'm here to serve you. So with that being said, um, as, as John was mentioning, uh, we are uh, TPC training now. Uh, we try to be the uh, uh, end-all and be-all solution for any of your training needs. And so I will allude to that periodically throughout the course. Uh, we do have the instructor-led portion, which is what this is tailored from. There's also, we have uh, online th uh, cl classes as well. And much of the information that we present will be linked together. Uh, it is the intent of much of the online training, however, to be much more in depth, getting into the very nitty gritty details and, and technicality of many of our topics that we discuss, including basics of electricity, generation, code, that kind of thing, all of which will be touched on throughout this webinar. So our discussion points for today. So first I'm gonna go over the purposes and applications of generators. So this includes where we would typically find generators, uh, why they're being used and how they're being used. Next, we'll go, we have to cover electricity generation principles. This is absolutely essential in order to understand how we generate electricity and why it's generated in the manner that we're doing. This will enable any technicians or any observer when it comes to troubleshooting or something goes wrong to be able to identify the problem and more adequately and more efficiently be able to address it. And so then we'll be talking about prime movers. Now, prime movers refer to pretty much anything that moves the generator itself. However, we, I'm going to focus the discussion on diesel engines, mainly because diesel is the most common that is used. And we'll even discuss why that diesel engines are most commonly used. However, I will go so far in saying that we are prepared to give lessons on any prime movers, whether it be gas turbines, biogas. I've had a lot of students in the past that uh, they worked with landfill methane gases. That's what their generators ran on. Uh, of course, natural gas and whatnot. And so uh, we have the ability to, to cater the training to those needs as well. Also, then we'll talk about generator operation control. This is referring to all the various ways to turn it on, whether it be manually or automatic. And also even in the class, we'll go into detail how these controls work. 
Furthermore, there's other classes that are, are that are secondary to this. Like for example, a lot of generator operations are done, in fact, by PLCs um, and other type of UPS operation controls. And so, lastly, we'll talk about general generator maintenance. Now, this also includes uh, um, maintenance on the distribution system for the generator as well. So we're talking about from the point where the electricity is made through the switching system all the way up to the switch gear, the switchboard, ATSs, STSs, um, and, and how the generator integrates electrically with your facility. And then finally, we'll focus on the general maintenance associated with diesel engines. And as I mentioned with prime movers, we do this because diesel engines are the most common prime mover that is used in the industry. And so a standby generator system is comprised of two basic subsystems. First, we have the generator set, which is made up of the prime mover, the engine, and the alternator, also, or also known as the AC generator, and a local engine generator controls. And so the, the local engine generator controls is what brings these two together, so when we turn it on, they act together. And so, and then, of course, the distribution system. The distribution system, as I mentioned in the introduction before, was is what the transfer switch is, all the switch gear, how that generator, how it produces electricity, and how it interfaces with your facility. And so all of this is included as part of the maintenance. And so the purpose of the generator, first and foremost, the, um, oh, excuse me, go back here, may be legally required for occupancy, emergency systems, or continuous process operations. So legally required, there are code definitions that say when it is required. Not only in the National Electrical Code, but also in certain NFPA series, and even all the way down to the local level. For example, I know that Chicago has a local ordinance requiring that like all fire pump systems and emergency exits that are controlled by electricity must have a dedicated backup generator. And so many other places throughout the United States are the same way. And so other things that generators are used for peak shaving to reduce energy costs or as backup during power outages, power outages. And so not always will we have a engine like a diesel engine or a gas turbine, but some of the newer things that are coming in conjunction with UPSs, as you can see farther down, is simply using a flywheel. And the whole purpose of that is, is to provide just enough energy so if you have any power quality issues that your equipment will not see any interruption in the generation of the power. And so you can have a flywheel that can, some can spin as long as 15 minutes. And so also, this will cover a little bit about uh, uh, generators for comfort and convenience, but that also focuses on things like portable and mobile generators. Portable being the kind that you have at your house that you can physically pick up, typically the run on gasoline, or the mobile generators you would see pulled behind a truck of some kind. Um, even the mobile generators, we even discuss how the rules are if you decide to take that mobile generator for a temporary but relatively long period of time, like a couple of months, and that generator then becomes your primary source of power while you're doing construction, upgrades of the facility, your, your work is remote, whatever. There are rules for that. And then, of course, maybe part of cogeneration or as a part, part, part of an uninterruptible power supply. And so um, the uh, cogeneration, in many cases, even power plants have the ability for cogeneration. And so a lot of large facilities will have that too. And so, for example, at a uh, uh, um, at the steel mill, I know here's the steel mill in uh, Gary, Indiana, they have, from the heat that's left over from their, when they're uh, mel uh, melting the steel down, in their heat just generated, they use that to generate steam, which then, of course, then moves a turbine, which powers a, gener a generator. And this is the uh, essence of a cogeneration. And then, of course, with the uninterrupted power supply system, the Many people believe and understand that the uh, uninterrupted power supply is in the word. It's designed to provide uninterrupted power. However, one of the things it also does, as I mentioned, with the, I alluded to with the flywheel, is to provide more clean power. So the uninterrupted power supply not only provides uninterrupted power, but by the essence of how it works, it also provides clean power, giving you electricity that is uh, um, void of all the various things that are associated with power quality. And so, in the NFPA series, specifically the NFPA 70, they define emergency power here, as you can see, with an alternate source of energy. That basically provides power. The key part here, though, is to understand that it, what constitutes emergency power is that it must be able to come online and accept the load in 10 seconds. This is one of the primary reasons why diesels are used for emergency power. 
assuming that you have a, a, the ability to keep the engine warm, usually some type of block heater or oil heaters in the diesel engine, a diesel engine usually can accept a load in less than three to five seconds, well within the 10 second standard. Unlike a gas turbine engine, on the other hand, a gas turbine engine takes up to 45 to 50 seconds to spin up. Hence why we move to standby power, as you can see here, standby power must be able to accept the load within 60 seconds, and oftentimes, especially for larger applications, a gas turbine will be used. And so, uh, in many cases, this is an independent source, as you can see, intended to, power supp to supply power and must be available within 60 seconds. And so, if the standby power does not fit into the emergency power or the standby power, then it's considered what's called optional standby power. And in many cases, if you have a facility that draws an, an immense amount of energy, it could be in your benefit to have optional standby power mainly because so you don't have any, it will reduce your energy because you're not pulling as much energy, for energy from the grid and some electric power distribution companies will actually pay the company for your optional standby power, having you bring your generators online and sometimes if you're generating a net surplus can actually feed back into the grid. And I would, like I said, in general my experience has been that it's only practical if you have a large, very power hungry facility. And so, the FPA 70 also defines what prime, the different types of power. In this case, we have prime power. That's like what you see here. You have the nuclear power plant, and you have Hoover Dam. These are facilities that their whole purpose in life, they're 100% uptime, basically what generates utility. This is what they do under normal conditions. All right, so now we're gonna break into the how a generator works. When we get to this point, at this point, I would introduce the basics of electricity. Part of the basics of electricity is understanding that voltage is, in fact, the force that moves things. Current is the energy that is being used, and power is the product of both voltage and current. Other rules that apply to this, when troubleshooting the general generator itself, current always produces heat, and current always produces an electromagnetic field. And in many cases, when we're trying to control electricity, we are trying to use those aspects of current. And so here in this diagram that you see, we have an AC generator and a DC generator. With the only difference between the two, draw your attention to the commutator. Notice that the AC generator here has two rings as opposed to the DC generator that only has one. The DC generator, in fact, does not generate a straight horizontal line like you would think that of DC power. As a matter of fact, what it does is it generates a series of humps as that ring go, rotates within the magnetic field. How we smooth that line out is we add armatures to that, which basically makes several humps inside of it, basically making a, a, a part at the top a straighter line. And so that is how DC power is generated. And in many cases, if you have a DC generator, you will notice that you will have a, a rectifier, also called a DC to DC converter, what they, what they mean by that, but a rectifier, what that does is basically takes an alternating current of some kind, a moving current, in this case, a, that whole positive hump that you would see on the waveform from the DC generator, and making it a more smooth line that is more, that is more useful if we want to have DC power. And so, other things to keep in mind when we talk about in this portion here, there are every electrical facility that there is, we are always confined by power. There is only so much energy you're going to get from the transformer that's feeding your building. Also because almost all electrical distribution is in parallel, and one of the rules associated with putting uh, circuits in parallel is that the voltage is constant across the circuit. This works hand in hand with how the generator works in that the RPMs of the generator and the voltage of the generator and the frequency of the generator are all tied together. So in order to maintain the speed of the, in order to maintain voltage and the frequency, the 60 hertz coming on the generator, we must maintain the speed. And so what this then leads to what we can affect in the whole power equation, power equals voltage times current, is the only thing we can affect is current, which if you remember how your outlets work at home, that is the very one thing that you're trying to control your outlet is how much current that you're drawing. And the generator works under this very fund, this very same fundamental. And so what the generator can do then is it can manipulate that electromagnetic field via what's called an exciter. 
This picture that you have up here is an example of a large excitation system. And so this is a two megawatt generator, as you can see, and it, there is multiple stages of quote unquote excitation. First beginning with the permanent magnet generator here, and it is what it sound like, sounds like. Unlike most generators that use electromagnets, this is a smaller permanent magnet generator, and believe me, those magnets are very powerful. And if you pass any type of conductor through the magnetic field generated by any magnet, you will generate current because the effects of current is heat and the electromagnetic field. And so the electromagnetic field is the best used, and if you move any type of magnetism whatsoever, you're going to generate that field. And so that's how this works. And so the permanent magnet generator will then take that, as, the, as it's rotating, will take that electromagnetic field, allow it to be affected through some type of variable resistor to yet another field coil that you see here, which is called the exciter itself, through yet another system of variable resistors. And then by varying that variable resistor, we can then vary the amount of current that is passing through the rotor and the stator of the exciter, thereby increasing or decreasing the intensity of the magnetic field in the generator. And this happens almost in real time. And so this is how a generator is able to accept varying loads. So you may have a generator that can kick out 1,000 watts, but if you only want to use 300, it is this portion here that allows that to you only use part of the electricity. Basically, you reduce the magnetic field via the excitation system. And this is one of the primary components associated with the generator. And so with this being said, basically electrical power generation is you take a prime mover, you put it on a rotary, a rotary contraption called the generator, has multiple coils in there as densely compact as possible, takes that magnetic field, and if you pass any magnetic field or any conductor through a magnetic field, you will generate current. And so here, we put in the fuel, which is the use of energy. We move that fuel, that, or we move the primary moves as a result of that fuel, creating the force and the energy, which then creates work. That's why we measure it in watts. And so the governor of the engine controls that. And so one of the biggest things that, is, uh, as far as calibration goes on prime movers, is to make sure that the governor definitely maintains itself at 60 hertz under all conditions. So here, as you can see, the number of poles times the speed over 120, this is how we determine the hertz of it. Basically, this formula that you see here will determine how fast we're going to ramp up the, the engine as it moves. And so we, we also we go through this in, in our classes and uh, show them this is how you can, I, if you need to, mate a prime mover to a generator and what speed to set it at. And so then a voltage regulator maintains the, the controlling excitation. And the essence of that voltage regulator is a simple variable resistor. If you increase the resistance, you decrease the current, thereby decreasing the intensity of the magnetic field. And the opposite is equally true. And so with this, then we, of course, have an output of electrical energy. And this electrical energy is all susceptible to that electromagnetic field. And my experience working even at the nuclear power plant, Nuclear power plant, that generator is about the size of a locomotive, which when you think about it, that, that relatively small contraption kicks out well over a billion watts. And how it's done is by, by having a very intense magnetic field. Other things of prime movers, these are some other examples. So the primary that we see here are internal combustion reciprocating and, of course, rotary and, gat and turbine. And so rotary and turbine are the most efficient, hence why they're primarily used in prime power. However, rotary and turbine generally take a time to speed up and take, and as I mentioned before, takes, like even for a gas turbine, takes a good 50 seconds or so to get it to spin up and take the load. Internal combustion, it's cheaper, but it's also more maintenance intensive. And in general, any type of turbine is more efficient than any type of combustion, and so, that is also one of the reasons why turbines are typically associated with prime power as opposed to standby power. And so here's a general list of all the, of the typical ones you would see. As you can see, diesel, gas, natural gas, propane, biomass, methane, et cetera. And so um, 
but even the turbines, all the turbines are generally the same. The only variable is how much of the substance, the fluid that you're going to pass through, whether it be air, gas, steam, water, they're all about the same. And so, and these still to this day, even a steam turbine is still the most efficient complex machine, basically taking the energy and converting it directly into electricity. And so we also, once we start getting into prime movers, as I mentioned earlier, we talk about um, primarily internal combustion, mainly because these are typically the most common that we do maintenance on. So I go into the fundamentals of how a reciprocating engine works. And so this helps because as you're doing your at least monthly testings on a generator, it really does help to understand when you're walking through it to be able to listen and observe, be able to feel the, the engine as it's rumbling and understand what normal operation entails. So that way, if anything is wrong, especially after you've been doing it for a few years, you can identify just by listening to it and feeling, looking around, there's no invasive anything, just by using your senses to be able to determine what's wrong with the engine. And I'm sure if we have any motorheads out there, you guys can attest to that. A lot of times, if you've been working on an engine for quite a long time, you can just tell just by listening to it. Or as you're driving down the road in your car, you can tell, ooh, something doesn't feel right. And so when I start talking about internal combustion, these are the type of things that I'm trying to get my students to understand. So in basic terms, internal combustion engine converts first fuel to mechanical energy. And as you see in the diagram on the left, it's generally a piston. Fuel goes in, mixes with air. Um, with a gasoline engine, basically you have a spark plug that ignites it. With a diesel engine, it works on the compression. You compress any fluid enough and it will explode. And that's the essence of a diesel engine. Once, the, once that combustion occurs, it then is, of course, exhausted. And so, although there are numerous variations, as I mentioned before, the most common standby generator is a basic four-stroke diesel engine. And so, um, and as I meant, if you maintain a diesel engine, the diesel engine will last a very, very long time. But the key is proper maintenance. In many cases, many adept diesel techs will tell you that diesel engines are killed. They are not, they don't just break. And so when referring to generators, the engine is generally referred to as the prime mover. And so many times in our classes, you will hear, at least me, refer to generators, the engine, or excuse me, the, the engine and the prime mover interchangeably. So, so options in, include automatic features. So for example, uh, most of the generators you have a standby power. This is a typical control panel. You have your subtype of local control and some type of auto control. Also, within the generator contraption itself, you can have a manual transfer, you can have an automatic transfer. It allows you to parallel the generators. However, when generators are paralleled, you have to be careful in how they're hooked up. It is required by code that each generator have its own dedicated circuit breaker. And so, even if you are taking multiple mobile generators, for example, out in the field in the middle of nowhere, you still have to make sure that each one of those individual generators has its own independent dedicated circuit breaker. This is basically to prevent one generator from backfeeding into the next generator. So when we start talking about paralleling and refer to this, we make sure that we distinguish what exactly paralleling means and so and how to hook it up and to make sure that you don't use one generator to blow up the other generator. And so typical automatic controls. And so as you can see here, we have speed and voltage regulation. The speed is typically maintained by the governor and the engine. And of course, the voltage regulations as I mentioned before is by the exciter. Sometimes these controls are located separately, depending on the, the model, the age, and all kinds of various factors. It is not all, all inclusive in inside the control panel. And so part of being trained on how to maintain an operator generator is being able to identify, yes, this is the engine. This is right here is the governor of that engine. This over here is the exciter. This right here is the control system. This is how I turn it on, this is how I turn it off. Those type of things. And so part of doing this, and we go through this in our training, is how to identify all these parts in it. And so you understand how they all interact together. Other types of manual controls, as you can see here, is we have our switch gear. One of the things I harp on in my class is to also understand the differences between a switch gear and a switchboard, because there are a difference. Also with transfer switches, there are three primary kinds of transfer switches. You have your automatic transfer switch, you have your static transfer switch, and you have your manual transfer switch. And in fact, the, standard tra the uh, static transfer switch and automatic transfer switch can double as a manual. You just go up to the, the, the console, hit, go from auto and turn it to manual. That means you have to push the button to actually transfer the switch. 
And so um, in some of the classes I've taught before, um, especially regarding data centers, if a lot of you are in that industry, uh, I have a lot of questions regarding how UPS systems work in the various kinds. There are many different kinds of UPS systems and the how they are configured is based on how the generator itself will interface with it and how that switching from your utility service power to the generator is affected. Other things in other classes we talk about well as well that's very important is the order of that switching. And so even in an automatic system, the order of switching that load over is imperative. This is where the timing within the circuit breakers are set for a very specific reason. Because in the event that you lose power, especially for emergency power, you can probably stand in your electrical room, you can hear all the switches as the power switches while the UPS is holding on to the power to your load with batteries, and then you can hear also at the same time you can hear the generator firing up. Typically with a lot of large diesel engines, a, a good perfect switchover is usually less than three seconds. But as you can see with the code, as I mentioned earlier, you have up to 10 seconds to do that. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we'd be, uh, with distribution, so I pointed this out as well, manual, automatic, and static switching. So this affects your transfer from utility to generation power. It may contain a subcomponent to call the generator. And what I mean by calling the generator is that some type of condition must have been met in order for that component to say, hey, generator, it's time for you to come on. So this is important to understand this because when you test your generator, this is the point from where you have to test it. So whatever entity, whether it be your switchboard, the transfer switch, even the even something attached to the generator itself, whatever it is that calls that generator when you lose your power to cause the generator to come on in the first place, you have to test it from there. And so whatever that remote location is. And so usually this component is a separate component all in itself or a computerized function in a PLC, something to that effect. And if you have any, especially if you have like a, the modern systems have what's called an emergency power management system, EPMS. Uh, you can actually sit at a computer console and do all the tests right there. With a mouse click, you hit start remotely from pick your switchboard. And it switches over, simulates the test. You can hear outside the generator kick on and you let it run. So switchboards and switch gears so these are the components made up of circuit breakers and used for the isolation and distribution we talk about in the class too that why circuit breakers are done the way they're done meaning that each circuit breaker is configured for not only the voltage and the amperage but the timing of which it is designed to clear this timing effect is critical to make a smooth transition and so these timings cannot be messed with. This is an engineering level uh, adjustment. And so it is always a bad idea as a technician to take it upon themselves to make these adjustments just because a circuit breaker is tripping when it shouldn't be. Because that timing portion of a, cir of a circuit breaker is part of the switching system of the entire distribution system of your facility. And so that's one of the critical aspects when I talk about how the switching works. Also, as I mentioned, the switchboard and switch gears. The primary difference between a switch gear and switchboard is physical size. In many cases, we talk about, uh, a lot of people ask us, well, what's the difference? Well, we have types of circuit breakers. All of us are probably familiar with a moldy case circuit breaker. Those are those little circuit breakers we have in our power panels at home, but they can get pretty big. I think they max out at about 800 amps. It might actually get bigger than that. And those circuit breakers are quite large. Those circuit breakers are also considered what's called rackable. What they do is you rack them out, usually on a worm gear of some kind, and they can weigh a few hundred pounds. And so that means you will have to have some kind of chain fall or, or a <clears throat> pneumatic hoist to take it off and move it. And to understand that, yes, a switchboard can be very large, but a switch gear, on the other hand, has what's called a, power, a PCB. Uh, I think it's a power control breaker is what it stands for. And that's the physical components inside of it are physically large. If you look inside there, you can see the half moon gears that are rather enormous. And so the molded case circuit breaker, which is associated with switchboards, the whole contraption is rated. So if any part of that molded case circuit breaker is compromised, cracked, melted, whatever, the whole thing has to be replaced. Whereas in a PCB, if any piece of it, each piece is of the, of the assembly is rated. And so it can be taken apart. 
And so you can imagine that a PCB being physically bigger takes up more space, and a multi-case circuit breaker does not. And so as a result, a PCB is found in switch gears, and consequently meaning that switch gears, which would be found in the middle room, have to be accessible from two sides in order to facilitate maintenance. And so if you have this switch gear, this contraption that switches power in the middle of your room, the reason it's there is because you need to have access to both sides. Likewise, if you have a switching mechanism on up against the wall, that is a switch board because you only need access to one side because it has the physically smaller molded case circuit breakers. And so this will help you identify and help you, of course, when we start talking about switch gears and switch boards, which is which. And typically, what you're going to see with PCBs is you're going to see much higher voltage and relatively low amperage. Whereas with multi case circuit breakers, you're going to see relatively lower voltage and much, much higher amperage. Simply because as you pass through a transformer, that's what a transformer does. It takes the voltage, steps it from a higher voltage down to lower voltage, in turn stepping up the current. And so here's an example of a common UPS. As I mentioned before, a common thing that we uh, talk about are how UPS systems. This specifically is called a double online conversion. And so what this means is, is that we have the double conversion. Basically, we have a rectifier. What a rectifier is, in any context, basically takes an alternating signal and turns it into a direct signal. And then we have an inverter, which takes a direct current signal and turns it back into alternating current. Through this process of conversion, we clean the power. And if you notice, we have a DC cell, and that could be a battery, that can be uh, a solar cell, it can be that flywheel thing that I told you about, it can be any of that. So either way, in that process, after the rectifier, before the inverter, where we have that DC power at, that is where, as you can see, that is plugged into. And so in that process of providing the uninterruptible power, we're cleaning the power as well. Now keep in mind, the batteries that are associated with uninterruptible power are different than the batteries associated with, say, a diesel engine to turn it over. And so, although the maintenance is similar, you cannot exchange the two things. For the engines, like your car or the diesel engine, the, ga the battery is designed to have a relatively hot, well, not relatively, it is a very high amount of current in order to facilitate that quote-unquote cranking amps. Whereas a UPS battery is designed to have a relatively low amperage draw. And the differences is between the two is that you have a high amount of energy for a very short period of time for a starting battery versus a relatively long amount of time for a relatively low amount of amperage. And so how they work and how they function are very different. And so in many cases, the requirement, this is under the NFPA 76 and 77, I believe, the requirement is up to 10 minutes. And so, yes, that is a relatively long amount of time because in most cases, your generator needs to be able to accept the load in, well, less than 10 seconds. But this is allowing you to facilitate the time so if anything goes wrong, it gives you at least a few critical minutes to address the problem. And so, part of the things, at least in the data center course that I wrote, is I want to address this. Is this part of a troubleshooting thing? If your switching does not facilitate like you want it to, the batteries will at least hang on to your critical load while you try to figure it out. And so, once again, as we talk about this, the UPS systems have have the purpose of providing uninterrupted power via some type of medium. Usually this is in conjunction with your generator and also cleaning the power in the event that you have dirty, unreliable utility power for whatever reason. And so, also, we talk about generator loading. Now, in some of my basis class, I talk about what's co what constitutes a reactive load. So what constitutes a reactive load is any type of load that generates its own magnetic field or takes time to, to charge, usually in a rapid sense. For example, anything like a capacitor. And in many cases, if you have a large uh, uh, power that is associated with air conditioning units, you have to deal with a very reactive load associated with not only the, the capacitors, but also the, uh, the turning over of the compressors. And so in many cases, not only does the capacitor allow the AC unit, the air conditioning unit, to pull power when it starts without dimming all your lights, but it also goes into balancing the load to, prove, to let, make the load less reactive so it doesn't affect the gener generator negatively. 
And so we discuss these types of things in the class as well. And so some of the things we also do is we consider reduced current starting methods. And so that's one of the primary purposes of a VFD. And so in my class, I have a, I, I draw a quick diagram of showing what it looks like when a motor turns over. So when a motor is first activated, it draws an extreme amount of current to overcome that initial static friction for a brief period of time. That immense amount of energy is pretty much energy that you never get back. And this is one of the first applications of a VFD was to take the motor, turn it down to its lowest operatable state, and leave it there so that way the energy does not have to be used to affect that static friction associated with startup. Although VFDs do a lot more, lot more things than just this, this is one of the advantages of a VFD. Also, the generator loading sequences. In general, it is a bad idea to turn everything on all at once. That's how you blow stuff up. In general, what you want to do is you want to sequence the stuff up. And so we talk about schemas and how to uh, sequence how, the how things are loaded onto the generator and also how to turn on the generators if you have multiple generators. Because in general, if you have multiple generators on the same circuit, you want to ramp those generators up incrementally. Then, of course, voltage regulation, UPS systems, transient recovery. We talk about all the various types of, as you can see in the, the diagram below, the types of, of uh, um, power quality issues. A transient, of course, being a spike above the amplitude of the current. And, of course, a notch being a dip in it. Swells, those are caused by, uh, honestly, like if you were to drop a power line, for example, and it will shorten out on the ground, that's going to cause a swell every time. We have, uh, excuse me, that causes a sag. What causes a swell is if you're expecting, if you're drawing more, if you're expecting to draw more current, but you're not. And so for, and that's basically, it's a power equals current times voltage. So if you have more voltage, you have less current. If you have less current, you have, yeah, if you have more current, you have less voltage. And so like a sag, for example, if you have a line that's being shorted on something, you're going to get a sag every single time. Because that every time that line touches, it's having an instantaneous draw of current, which is causing the sag in the voltage. And then, of course, we're all familiar with interruptions. But interruptions also falls not only to blackouts, but if, you're, if your area is prone to brownouts. And so then I also talk about harmonics. Now, harmonics is a relatively complex concept to, to find, but at the same time, it's also relatively easy. Because one of the things to take in mind with harmonics is that all things in the universe exist on a harmonic series. The very same harmonics that you hear, the 60 hertz, like when you walk by a transformer, you hear that buzzing, is the same very, very same harmonics that you hear in a musical instrument when you pluck a guitar. It's all the same. And so some of the rules that are associated with harmonics is that, uh, first of all, the harmonic series is represented as, as a mathematical series. It's one, one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth, and it goes all the way to infinity. One of the rules that's associated with harmonics is that the farther you get from the source, which is one, and in the case for electricity, that's that 60 hertz, the amplitude of each subsequent series gets less and less and less. So the greater the amplitude of the primary is, the greater the amplitude of the subsequent harmonics as it goes down. The harmonics are always there. There's nothing we can do about the harmonics. It's just a natural phenomenon that occurs with anything that has a frequency. And so in many cases, the even harmonics, we really only care about the first harmonic, second harmonic, and fourth harmonic. They cancel each other out because they are evenly divided. But when we get to the odd ones, like the third harmonic specifically, that generates a leftover current. And that current then can build up on things, causing a capacitive effect, which then causes a discharge someplace. And so this is why we talk about harmonics, because like if you had a bank of motors lined up against the wall, this is one of the reasons why there needs to be a physical grounded barrier in between each of those motors is to reduce the harmonic effects of those motors. Generators are the same way. In most cases, I haven't seen generators before that are right next to each other. I've only seen them in their own individual uh, sections and they're separated. But the same effect happens because keep in mind, generators and motors are identical in every sense of the word. So the only difference is that we have a prime mover turning the stator on, on a generator, making it a generator, and a motor, you put electricity to it, and it turns it, causing an emotion going out. 
That is the only difference between a generator and a motor, both of which generate the frequencies that I was discussing in harmonics. So generator maintenance, maintenance on the generator itself is relatively straightforward. That's the good news. Most of the maintenance actually associated with generator is uh, more with the prime mover. And so when doing this, a couple things you need to take into account. First and foremost, anytime we're doing maintenance or operating any of these things, we need to make sure we're safe about it. And so always when you do this, you need to make sure you switch the generator from manual into local or local control. Mainly because if you have an automatic control, this is basically to prevent someone else from starting the generator while you're working on it. And of course, we advocate following the lockout tagout rules, not only because I mean, me personally, I firmly believe in it, but it's also the law. And keep in mind, hot oils and fluids can cause serious harm. This is very much associated with, with diesel engines. Even, the, even if you have block warmers, it's designed to keep that at a certain temperature based on the size of the engine. And so those, the oil, the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the fluid that comes off of it can be very hot. Also, be aware of the noxious gases from the exhaust. It can be anything from carbon monoxide, um, and if you're using biogas, you can generate hydrogen sulfide. There's many different, different things, so it's always a bad idea just to stick your head over the exhaust while you're standing there. Uh, and the reason I point this out as well is the, the data center that I, that I uh, worked at briefly, there was uh, the bank of diesel generators was along the wall and outside. But above that, on the facility, on the roof, was a rooftop unit for the HVAC system to the offices. And so if we were running the bank of generators for testing, all that exhaust that came off the top of the generators would then get sucked in the air intake of the rooftop unit. So you need to be aware of such things. And so while this is going on, of course, keep all users informed and aware of what you're doing. Because in many cases, um, a lot of facilities have their people trained that if you hear that generator come on, that means something's going on. And so people are going to run around figuring out what the heck's going on. And so that, that's one of the reasons why you got to keep all users informed and aware. And so next is make sure that part of, well, part of the training of doing this, making sure you're aware of the hazards. And so that would include um, understanding what's under pressure. That would also include that while the generator is spinning, whether you have, while you have it anything on or off, it doesn't matter. If it's spinning, it is generating electricity. And so also use precautions to avoid arcing and sparking. This includes uh, electrically safe tools. If uh, you're wearing um, uh, arc flash protective gear, the, and also properly grounding if there is uh, electromagnetic fields to worry about, that's all part of that. When checking batteries, be aware. It is possible to get squirt in the face with electrolytes, especially if you're going to pop the lid and refill it because it could be under pressure. And so a lot of times this is why it's required to wear a face shield to prevent that acid from squirting you in the face. And so, and once again, remember, any turning of the generator will create electricity. And so even if you, if it's small enough, you can rotate it by hand. If you rotate it slowly by hand, at that moment, it's generating a current. And yes, if it's, if it's got a field in it, it will zap you. And so keep that in mind. So also maintenance on a generator as it's not optional especially if it's in the, in the legally required category. And this is where our references come from, specifically the NFPA 110 and 111. Those are the standards for uh, emergency, emergency uh, generators and for uh, stored electrical energy, so, such as batteries, flywheels, uh, solar energy, that kind of thing. And so maintenance is, is required for safety and reliability. It's absolutely important that you that you are diligent with your maintenance because this is the difference between someone getting hurt and also the difference between saving millions of dollars and having to replace the engine or the generator itself. And so much of the training we do is the maintenance. We go through the typical types of maintenance that's associated with it. And so once again, I also talk about the maintenance should always be conducted on an isolated system, whether that be conductive, uh, corrective maintenance or predictive or preventative maintenance. The purpose of that is so you don't affect the other systems. And of course, we always advocate follow the manufacturer's information or the NFPA 70B and the NFPA 70A. So in some of our classes, I know in our electrical safety class, we're, there's a clause in NFPA 70E that we talk about saying that there's a standard that says that manufacturers are required to follow this law. And so there is, uh, that's to say that manufacturers, why we tell you to follow their, their information because it's in their best interest, both from a economic point of view and from a legal point of view that what they say that that machine can do and what its parameters are that's what it can do okay 
And so, of course, maintenance is crucial to maximizing engine life. And this goes back into what, what constitutes the time value of money. Because if you spend a million dollars on a diesel engine, the longer you have it, the more, the more uh, useful your money, the time value money you will get out of it. So load test and exercise the system. This is one of the one of the most common maintenance. Well, this is probably the most common one. Some places require it. This testing to be happened once a week. I know at the power plant that's the way it was. Their backup generators were once a week. That was every Wednesday. Yeah, I had to turn them over. Um, but according to the NFPA uh, 110, if you have an emergency backup generator set, it must be tested at least once a month, and it must be done under load. And so while you're keeping these load tests, you must keep the records of this. The purpose of keeping the records, though, is so you can track if there's any deterioration of the generator over time, and not just the generator, but also the engine as well. Also, the reason you have to do this is also for EPA reasons if you're using an internal combustion engine. Especially if it's a large engine, you have to keep track of the gases that are being emitted to the atmosphere. That's also why you have to have records. So one thing to keep in mind of diesel engines, they prefer to be under load. Unloaded engines will cause wet stacking, and wet stacking over time will seriously harm your engine. And so basically what wet stacking is, is if you have, basically when unburned fuel passes through the engine, it condensates on the inside of the exhaust. And that condensation, we're talking this oily residue from diesel fuel, will build up. And any of the other crap that was in the fuel from when it was burned, the soot and the ash, will stick to that fuel, and that stuff will build up over time. And it will restrict the exhaust if it gets bad enough. It will cause the engine to smoke. In worst case scenario, it'll take really nasty unburned fuel and drip back down through your manifold inside the cylinders, causing your cylinders and your valves and, and your headers to all get all gooped up and stuff, making the engine run much less efficiently. And so this is the purpose of making sure you put the engine under load. And the NFPA 110 actually says a 30%, at least the 30% load is recommended, but the, the closer you get to 100%, the better. And so even if you say you don't want to put under a load, say like you want to, for whatever reason, as much, even if you do as much as once a quarter, you, you load test the, the generator once a month, but you don't put any, or excuse me, you, do, you cycle the generator once a month, but you don't put a load on it. Even if you were to put a full load on it once a quarter, allow that engine to heat up and burn off that uh, unspent fuel, that will do wonders for keeping your exhaust system on the diesel engine clean. And so, and once again, exercise the engine to assess early problems. Now, these exercises that you do, the NFPA 110 says you have to go for at least 30 minutes. And so the, pro the, the, the purpose of that is, is, the, is to, to observe and to listen for the various functions of the engine. Allow the coolant to pass all the way through the engine. Allow the fuel to be pumped out of the tank that you have through the fuel management system, through the engine. And this entire time, this is what you're looking at. You're observing and you're listening to all these processes, how they're going on. Looking for water leaks, looking for fuel leaks. See if you have any oil. That's why they say run it for 30 minutes to give you adequate time to do this. So here, walk around, look and listen for abnormal operation. Use your senses. You don't have to touch it while it's running. You can just kind of go up to it and listen to it. If you hear a little strange rattling someplace, you need to investigate that. What is that rattling? Is that something that needs to be tightened? What is that? So, and once again, if you're testing the generator set, the code requires you that you test it from the transfer switch or the point at which your backup system calls the generator. A lot of times it is from the transfer switch. And so once again, also check the fuel consumption and the fuel quality. Keep in mind that diesel fuel is prone to having biologics that grow in it over a period of time. And so inside the tank, what ends up happening is condensation from the air will get inside, inside the tank, and then when it cools off, it condenses and drops to water. Water and oil don't mix, and so, but if that water stays there long enough, algae will grow. And then what will happen later on, the water evaporates and the algae stays behind. That algae, if you leave it in there, will actually be passed through your engine. It causes all kinds of nasty crap that goes through your engine, may cause it to work uh, inefficiently. And so it is so very important that you keep track of your fuel quality as well. Now, I will tell you, if you're constantly going through fuel, this, like, for example, with a diesel truck going down the road, they don't have to worry about this because they're burning the fuel longer than it takes for the algae to set in. And so this is what this is one of the downsides of having a backup generator. The only time it ever comes on is when you're testing it. And so that diesel fuel, that 10,000-gallon belly tank that you have, could be sitting there for years. 
And so going through the seasons of the of the weather, water evaporating, condensing over and over again. And so it is in your best interest to periodically check that fuel to make sure there aren't any contaminants associated with it. And so if you have a lot of fuel, like say, for example, you have a dozen uh, backup generators and each of them have 10,000 gallon tank, it would be in your best interest to invest in a fuel polisher. Because what a fuel polisher does is Basically, it runs the fuel through a filtering system, cleaning out the water and, the, and any type of other uh, contaminants that could be found inside that generator or inside the, uh, the fuel. And this also goes into some of the maintenance that's associated with it. So like in many diesel engines, you will see the fuel filters. You'll notice the bulbs that are hanging horizontally, and you'll see the, the red fuel that's inside. Oh, by the way, don't ever use green fuel. That's for agricultural use. That's very illegal. But you'll see the red dyed fuel. But if you ever look at that fuel and it's cloudy, that's a bad thing. That means something was wrong with the fuel. So that's also one of the brief checks you could check. And that's what you're looking for during that 30 minutes while the engine's running. You're watching the fuel as it's passing through. And you can see it going in and out of the uh, uh, your uh, fuel filters. And so observe that. If it looks cloudy, that means you have a fuel quality issue. And so that will also cause your uh, to affect the longevity of the engine. And so on the generator itself, so it's, as we have a picture here of a, of a mobile generator, and so inspect the rotor and standard for cleanliness. And this is acceptable. I mean, this is old. You can see that the, the, uh, the shaft of the rotor there is a bit rusted, but it works just fine. It isn't overly corroded. You don't see the metal chipping away. Yeah, there's a little dust in there, but is it like a, a rat made a nest in there or there's a flock of birds living out of there? No. And so and sometimes if you have a generator that's located remotely, they'll want to make a nest in there. So this is what you're looking for. So making sure they're clean. Inspect the terminals, especially if your generator is a mobile generator like this one. It's going to be outside, and it's going to become susceptible to uh, uh, the, the ravages of the environment. And so they're going to corrode. And so one of the things when you clean off the terminals, even if your battery is your car, same thing. You should clean off that corrosion, but as soon as you see any type of pot, pocking of it, you know, the holes being formed in it, those terminals are done because that means the, re the resistance of those terminals has gone up, and they are no longer suited for having electricity going through them. And so that's what you're looking for in the visual inspection of it. Also, of course, every now and then use thermography. A lot can be told by using a thermo thermographic test of terminals. Load or load bank to generate at least 80%. The, this is for the generator at least once a year. And the purpose of this is, is to make sure that the components of the generator, like the exciter, work effectively. Make sure that the generator can actually handle the load without overheating and blowing itself up. This is kind of why you're doing it. And so if you suspect a malfunction, you can mag out a generator just like you do a motor. That will tell you if you have any current leakage across any of the insulation inside. And then, of course, you can also have a power quality check conducted. And a power quality uh, will tell you um, if you have a rotor that's that's uh, for whatever compromise that the mega didn't pick up. Um, you have you know some kind of dirt or contaminant in there. Even though a mega can't pick that up, it doesn't always. But a power quality check definitely will. And so these are typical maintenances. Of course, the last step being more corrective maintenance. But these are typical maintenances that should be done on a generator. And as I mentioned before, it's the generator itself. The maintenance on it is relatively easy in com compared to the diesel engine. And so for engine starting system, you check the engine starting system and the batteries, making sure that the, that the engine actually comes on. And if in the event you're using an emergency backup generator, that engine should turn over, even if it's you know 10 degrees outside. If you have, you'll have block heaters on there or, or uh, oil heaters on there, a jacket heater, something, something to keep the engine warm, it should turn over right away. There should be no sound. No, no, it should turn right over and take the load immediately. And so... And your batteries. What also includes in your batteries is also the battery charger. Now, sometimes some engines, the battery charger will be attached to the engine. Other times, the battery charger will be a very separate component within the general uh, generator enclosure. But as far as maintenance is concerned, that is still part of the maintenance. Also, some uh, I know the EPA definitely has emissions requirements. Uh, some municipalities they will have uh, exhaust noise requirements. So to make sure that your engine is sufficiently you know, shielded with the noise or it has the sufficient uh, sound dampening uh, equipment attached to it, whether it be a muffler or a resonator or something like that. And so be aware of that. That's also one of the reasons why you have to have documentation. You need to be aware of the noise. And of course, your cooling and temperature control, very, very important. So making sure that your, your uh, coolant pump is working, your water jacket heater is working appropriately. Uh, make sure you don't have any coolant leaks. 
And so checking the hoses, the fittings, making sure that fan is turned appropriately, making sure the radiator on the front of it is clean. It's just like a heat. It's just like the heat exchanger for uh, an HVAC system. You don't want to have all that cottonwood stuff stuck to that. You got to make sure that's clean. Otherwise, if it's not clean, it's not effectively cooling. And of course, lubrication. Lubrication. Um, it's a very important part of it that keeps making sure that you're not overheating the engine. Because one of the things. The primary purpose of lubrication, any mechanical equipment, is to keep the engine from overheating due to friction. And so this is why it's important that you check the lubrication. And this is even in your car. All lubrication breaks down. And so over time. And so if you pull out the lubrication and you notice, like you take a sample of the lube out of it, and it's black and, 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 and uh, thick and stuff, yeah, it's time for an oil change. That means that, oil, that, that lubrication is not being able to do its job. And, of course, filter maintenance. Like most of our maintenance is on anything we do, most maintenance always boils down to keeping the system clean and making sure that, and, and basically inspecting it, make sure there's nothing out of the ordinary. And so this includes filter maintenance. It's your fuel filter, your oil filter, if you, ha if you have air filters. All these should be on a regular schedule. And typically, if you only turn it over uh, to do test runs, you should probably do that based on time it's being ran. And so every, I don't know, uh, 50 hours, you change the oil filter, something to that effect. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, wet stack stacking prevention, because wet stacking is one of the more common things that are associated with diesel engines. And so, oh, and one of the other things I want to mention about wet stacking. And so in our class, we also talk about the various types of smoke that you can see coming from the stacks. And part of that is, uh, for example, if you see white smoke coming out of a diesel engine, that basically is unburnt fuel. And so some of that unburnt fuel, well, most of it starts at with you don't have a, a heavy enough load on the engine. White smoke, though, can also be associated with wet stacking. So, for example, you did put a load on it. Now you're going to have more air passing through it. And it's actually going to take that fuel while it's hot and make it evaporate. You're going to see the, the, uh, the white smoke coming out of it. Other colors of smoke, blue and black smoke are bad. Blue smoke is an indication that you're actually mixing the fuel oil inside the cylinder. You have a major oil leak. That's an indication that the head gasket is leaking by or that for whatever reason, oil is getting into the combustion chamber. That is a bad thing. And so that generally means that's one of, the, one of the things you're looking for. So when you're standing outside the enclosure, you're going to be looking, okay, you should go outside and look at what the exhaust looks like because it tells you all kinds of stuff. And, of course, black oil is basically an indication that you're burning oil elsewhere but not in the actual combustion chamber. And so and in many cases... You can even tell by the smell. And so those, those are experienced diesel techs. They can, they can just tell by smelling it, if, if it's running lean or if it's running rich. And so, and these are adjustments that these technicians know how to make. And so I can address these questions to some degree. I will say, though, that, that uh, my experience with diesel engines is limited. I've only been working on it for about 10 years now. But at the same time, uh, I'm not, I, the reason I say that, because I know of a few diesel experts, I'm like, yeah, you guys clearly know a lot. My point about this is, though, is that with experience, and as you do this, just simply watching, listening, and smelling how the engine is operating can tell you loads of information. You don't have to unbolt anything. You can just tell just by listening. And so, in general, any maintenance on these generators and engines, just use your senses. And that's what this, and I harp on that throughout my classes. And so, throughout the course, these are the things that we've been referencing. And so one of the books that I, that I reference a lot is that what you see here, the on-site on power generation. It's very in-depth. It's For all practical purposes, it looks like a textbook. And so it goes into depth how electricity works, that electromagnetic field, the various types of exciters. It talks about the diesel engine, how, how the, the uh, um, uh, internal combustion sequence works, that kind of stuff. And, of course, I alluded to the NFPA 110 and 111. These are the standards upon which the what requires you to – uh, how you have to maintain. I mean, I talked about um, NFP 110. That's where it says at least once a month uh, for at least 30 minutes, you have to put the generator under load and, and test it. It's an NFP 110. And so then, of course, the NFP 111, that primarily pertains to if you have batteries in the UPS system, but still it applies because chances are if you have a UPS system with backup batteries, especially if it's a large one, you're going to have a generator. So, so with that being said, that brings us to the end of the course here. And so I can answer any questions if you have any. John, are you there? Yeah, thanks, Kurt. Um, again, uh, we try to keep this very high level, and we want to be respectful, respectful of your time. So 
Uh, we're open to take any questions. Just ask any questions in the uh, box down on the right-hand toolbar that you have there for the GoToWebinar um, feature. Uh, one question, though, that we tend to get, and I, I addressed this earlier, is uh, whether or not you can get a copy of the, of the webinar and the presentation. Absolutely. Um, everyone will receive a follow-up email at the end of this presentation, so please just respond to that email and let us know that you'd like a copy of the presentation, and I'd be happy to send you out uh, the slides, or if you need a link to the video, um, I can send you out a link to where it will be on our YouTube page. So let's uh, let's start going through here and try to see if we can get some questions here. And we do have uh, one coming in right now. Um, Kurt, the question is: recommendations of time delay between transferring between sources to prevent compressor motage damage due to phase differences. Does three seconds versus 10 seconds make a big difference? That is a good question. Um, I will say that depends on the, the, the magnitude of the phase difference between changing from utility to generator. And in many cases, your, uh, you, if you have a UPS system or if you have your, your transfer switch, this is one of the th things that it will detect is that phase difference. And so yes, what you brought up is definitely a, a good point. And so um, this is also one of the reasons why you would do what's called an open transfer. And so meaning that you will have, uh, basically you'll, you'll break it before you make it. And so that's why all that switching, the time delay, that's, um, like I said, it, it, it all boils down to how out of phase it is. And this is the purpose of your transfer switches. My recommendation, if that's absolutely critical for the equipment, this is one of the things that a static transfer switch does. However, I will warn you that a static transfer switch is relatively expensive, but this is one of the benefits of a static transfer switch is it can take that high level of power, even if it's extremely out of phase, and make the correction for that during the transfer. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Kurt. Um, so our next question. Uh, rule of thumb for when natural gas makes more project sense versus diesel units. <laughs> oh, okay. Say a rule of thumb makes more uh, natural gas. Well, whew, that's a good question. So, ne generally speaking, in my opinion, and at least in, and also in, in my experience, is natural gas. The only downside to it is it doesn't turn over as quickly as a diesel engine does, just because the combustion sequence inside a natural gas engine. Uh, is is slightly different than it is in a diesel, and it takes it longer to warm up. But you can mitigate this by having those block heaters and jack heater, jacket heaters that I was talking about. And so really the only advantage of, say, natural gas over diesel is natural gas is cleaner. And so why a company would want to use natural gas is simply to reduce the cost on emissions. And so both can be used in both situations, and in both situations you have to be aware of the engine still needs to be warm, in order to facilitate the combustion. I will say this though, if the engines are cold, they both take a long time to warm up. And so in either way, the idea is to make sure that the engine is warm because you don't want to put the load of the generator on the engine until the engine has taken the time to warm up. And so if you use the natural gas, that is one of the, that's just as critical as it is for a diesel engine. I hope I answered your question again. <laughs> Uh, we actually did receive a, a question that I'll actually address. Uh, we got asked a question about online classes. Obviously, the slide we have up here is talking specifically about instructor-led training, and uh, TPC training does do online. Um, you can visit tpctraining.com for more information on that. But uh, the question is asking is, is that a live training or is that recorded so that you can do it on your own time? And TPC online is recorded so that you can do it on your own time. So. It does help if you've got things going on during the day, but you still need to get that training in uh, that your company is mandating from you. So uh, hopefully that's a brief answer to uh, to your question. Yeah, uh, I, I've taken a lot of the courses online myself, and even some of the longer courses can be as long as 12 hours of the training, but you can start and stop at any time. All right. Uh, Kurt, next question is, the what's the best way to provide hookup for a portable generator? Hookup how? Like, what do you mean, like hook up to the building or hook the generator to a prime mover? Uh, well, it doesn't specify, so can we address both? Sure. So um, hooking up to a building. 
So one of the first questions, if you're going to hook it up to a building, one of the first questions you got to ask yourself, is this permanent or this is temporary because this is code? If it's temporary, in other words, you're only going to do it for the for the day, and then at the end of the day, you're going to unhook it. Um, one, you got to make sure that there's, a, there's well, the, the load is adequate. But I'll tell you, though, a lot of people kind of freak out about that. Yeah, you could try to put a higher load on a generator. It just ain't going to work. It's only going to put out so much, and you're going to get – because essentially that's what a brownout is. A brownout in a utility is basically there's too much of a load on the system and it's pulling power from someplace else. And so what's going to happen is, is that if you try to put too much on it when you hook up to the building, is you're going to have things that are just simply not going to work. Now, if you're going to do, say, a permanent hookup, like you're going to leave it there overnight and it's going to be there for you know several days, one of the key aspects is you got to make sure you drive a grounding rod that is required by code. And yes, the grounding rod has to be 10 foot long, has to go all the way into the ground, and you got to clamp off to it. There's a whole process for that. That's uh, um, uh, Article 250 of the National Electrical Code. And so now if you're coupling the generator to a prime mover, the concept is very much the same as coupling a motor to a pump. In that, you want to make sure that it's exactly aligned, making sure that the engine, ha the governor is, is set for the speed, that, for the 60 hertz speed that you want out of it, and that the alignment, the alignment has to be as close to perfect as possible. Like I said, it's like the same thing between a pump and a motor. Because if they're out of alignment, they'll tear each other up. And so um, other things to include as far as hooking up the power to other things, like if you have a welder or whatnot, um, you have to be aware of the types of loads that you put on there. Meaning, as, as I was mentioning before, what a reactive load is something that has like an electric motor in it. Because what that does, that electromagnetic field generated by that motor, if there's enough of it, can actually backfeed into the generator, uh, like backfeed into the generator. And so how you can affect that is by putting on resistive and capacitive loads. And so you have to be aware of the, uh, the types of loads you're putting on there. Now, many of the uh, welders that you have in there, they will – I'm just using welding as an example – they will have a uh, uh, the welder itself will have the ability to dissipate that energy so it doesn't actually go back into the into the uh, the system. But keep that in mind if you're hooking it up to a system with a lot of motors, like for example pumps, um, those would um, if you do nothing but that you have to put in some type of switching mechanism that will pr basically a uh, um, uh, something akin to a transient surge suppressor. Basically, what it'll do is it'll open up if 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 that electromagnetic field associated with the loads will affect the generator itself. I hope I answered your question. And by the way, guys, when I answer your question, don't let me off the hook. If I don't answer it, say so. <laughs> All right, uh, Kurt, next question is, what temperature should the block heaters be kept at? Oh, that depends on the engine. Um, I'd ha I'd, honestly, I'd have to look that up. I don't remember off the top of my head. I'm sorry I couldn't give you a straight answer on that. Okay. Uh, does a code specify a minimum time for how long a backup gener generator must be run? And if so, uh, which code or must be able to run? Okay. That – not how long it can be ran. If the code, the code uh, uh, specifies anything, it will be how much fuel you have to keep on, on, on site. And in most cases, it's 24 or 48 hours. And where you're going to find that are in codes like – NFPA 110 is a good place to start. Uh, NFPA 101. NFPA 1 is a life safety code. So things in the life safety code, it will, it, it will specify how long your power has to be online and how much you have to keep it online in the event of a catastrophe. For example, uh, I think hospitals are required to have 48 hours on, 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 on hand, 48 hours of fuel. So how much fuel you have will determine how long the, the battery stay, or the uh, generator stays online. And so, of course, if you run out of fuel, the generator comes off. So um, in the extreme sense, your local ordinances will also have a, a priority list in the event of an, of, of an emergency of who gets the fuel first. I know, for, I know the hospitals are at the top of that list, but if, you have a, if you're not a hospital, uh, you may have to wait in line to get gas in the event that uh, um, there's a major emergency. And so what determines how long your, your engine or how long your generator must ha uh, be online for basically is determined by how much, fuel, how much of a fuel supply you have. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, what's a good minimum time to call up a generator and at the same time avoid false calling? In other words, temperature, power, interruption, things like that. Okay. Good question. And so the minimum time to call the generator, that's where that whole 10 seconds comes on. So 
that's what it was. When you initiate that calling of the generator sequence, if it's emergency power, it has to be able to come online and, and accept the load completely in less than 10 seconds. And so in many cases, like I said, if you have a backup diesel, even if it's a, even if it's a big 2,500 kW engine, you know, 24-cylinder diesel, that sucker will be able to take the load in less than three seconds if it's operating well. Now, um, what was the other part of that question again? S switching sequence? Uh, let me go back to it. Uh, yes, it's um, hang on. Uh, what's the good minimum time to call up the generator and at the same time avoid false calling? Ah, okay. so to avoid false calling. Okay, I'll make sure I answer that question. So um, that goes back to the startup time, but that's the purpose of that 30 minute runtime. So in the code, they allow that 30 minute runtime, and during that 30 minutes, that's what you're looking for is that very same thing you just asked. And so you're seeing if the faults are going to occur. This is why you have to observe the systems. In many cases, if you're dealing with a large system, it could take, I mean, uh, when, when I was helping with the data center installation, they had 2,500 kW generators located outside, but the calling happened from an electric room on the second floor inside the building. And so there's be as many as four of us technicians located various connected via radio, and the, we'd have that as a checklist. Okay, you're observing from where you called the generator, because there was a panel there, say, hey, there's warning lights that will tell us if anything was wrong. You'd have text down by the generator, listening to the generator, listening for the coolant, and verifying that, in fact, that the engine was working like it should have been. And if something was to malfunction, that the point at which you called it will say, hey, something's wrong. And so as far as the turnover goes, now many generators have, or the engines, will have a fault code. It's usually 15 seconds. 15 seconds meaning that, that uh, the engine will roar, 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 and the starter will, will stop. It'll do it again. And nothing happens, and then you'll get it, then you'll get an error. It's as much, basically it's uh, uh, I, ones I've seen has been like three five second turns, or five three second turns. I've seen variations of that. How many times will it hit that starter, and how long will it wait for it to actually turn over? And so, um, and I, I know that's contrary to the whole ten second rule, but that once again that depends on how you have the system set up, and that's part of your controls portion of it. So I hope I answered almost every variation of that question. <laughs> All right, uh, next question is, uh, how long does a backup generator last before it's killed? In other words, what's the average service life? Oh, good question. So the average service life of a typical generator should push, if you take care of it, should easily push 20 years. And so as far as the average goes, that goes based on if you're buying a Caterpillar, a Cummins, or a John Deere engine, it depends on the engine. In such, in such specific statistics, you'll have to get from the manufacturer. But a well-maintained generator should last you at least 20 years. All right. Um, next question is, uh, this is a good one because it's very specific to what the asker uh, is doing at their site. So the question is, I have a natural gas generator, and I notice it seems to have a slow spin-up to get to full speed. By ear, it's probably a few RPM slow for maybe a minute or so. That is result of dis is is that a result of the difference in natural gas as a fuel? It is not a critical application, but it is in a cold climate. You have um, any thoughts on that? When you were describing that, my mind went to uh, two possibilities. Uh, the first possibility is that uh, you have a restriction in your fuel air in your fuel air mixture. Um, base, most likely the air for that could be something like your, um, it may not be, you probably change your filters and all, but that's what would happen if you say had a dirty air filter. Uh, the other thing would be is if your, the, the engine itself is not, uh, uh, uniformly heated all the way through the engine. In other words, uh, say you had 10 cylinders and, uh, eight of those cylinders were at 80 degrees and one of those, and two of those cylinders are at 65 degrees. That would cause also a slow turnover because you could have an uneven combustion whenever the cranking happens. And so those are where my mind goes. So one way you can uh, look for that is uh, in the fuel air mixture. You can see, uh, do a test on if the engine's run lean and run hot. Basically, for, and have the, the, uh, the sensors, are not lean and hot, lean and rich. If it's lean, lean, and, lean and rich. So have your sensors and observe it the minute you turn it over to see what the fuel air mixture is doing. That's one way you can test it. The other way, the other portion of it is using thermography. And so 
take a baseline measurement with an infrared camera, look at it, take a broadside and try to see all the temperatures, especially where you know where the combustions are going to occur, like near the heads and in the uh, um, uh, or the cylinders are located, and there look at all of it, see if the temperature is evenly distributed throughout the engine, crank it over and watch the temperature in real time as it increases throughout the engine. And so that's what I would suggest where you start to to address that that issue. All right, thanks, Kurt. Uh, we've got time for uh, one more question, and uh, it is this: Is there an advantage to keeping our fuel tanks full other than longer available runtime? Is there a fuel polisher that you have experience with or prefer using? <laughs> okay, uh, I'm not particularly loyal to any name brands. Uh, if that's what you're asking, um, uh, a fuel polisher is a, is a generally simple contraption. Uh, basically, all it is is just a pump, and it runs into a filter. That that that's it. And ba it run, it, ba it, run, it sucks the fuel f out of the tank and then puts it back into the tank. That's all a fuel polisher does. Now, some fuel polishers are fixed. Um, if you have belly tanks or whatnot, each one of your uh, units can have its own fuel polisher, but I think that's cost prohibitive. Uh, when you can just buy a, a uh, uh, you know, one you put on a cart, you, you drop the suction in inside the tank and, and put the, uh, the discharge in inside the, inside the uh, uh, where you fill the fuel at and just let it run. And so is there an advantage of keeping it full? The only advantage is for longevity of running. Um, or if you have any... Um, uh, code requirements that says you need to have at least 24 hours of fuel available at any given moment of the day, and so that would be based on your local ordinances and whatever. And uh, I, honestly, on the as far as what the NFPA series says, I'd have to do the research on that if it's this specifically tell you. I think it does, but I'd have to verify otherwise. Um, I would suggest though that um, uh, keep keeping your tank level low. What that does is that is actually bad because that allows more air to get inside. More air means more water, means more water than they can condensate onto the top layer of your tank, which then facilitates algae growth and, and other uh, biocontaminants. So it is, uh, with that in mind, it is better to keep the tank fuller than it is to keep it uh, uh, closer to empty. All right, thanks, Kurt. All right, everyone, uh, we've run to the end of our time, but, but I do wanna thank everyone uh, for your attendance today. Uh, Kurt, any last words? Uh, I don't think so. I think we're good to go. All right. Thank you again, everyone. Take care and have a good day.